All right, welcome to CS 3510 Lecture 2. Um, the topic of today's uh, lecture is the Master's Theorem. Uh, and urge sort. So recall we're in this first unit on um, algorithms. Where, uh, the, the, the title of the unit is called uh, div conquer, divide and conquer. And what the whole point of this unit is on recursive algorithms, algorithms which call themselves. So uh, a divide and conquer algorithm is, is one where you have some scheme, some setup, some way to split the problem up into smaller subproblems, and then those are called recursively on the uh, called recursively. Then those are split up again and again and again. Eventually, you hit some base cases uh, that then they're conquered at, and then there's some recombination logic that's used to combine back to the original answer. And a lot of uh, problems do have divide and conquer uh, solutions, and one of the motivating uh, parts of, I think, this whole unit, divide and conquer, is the fact that the divide and conquer algorithms are extremely elegant. They don't appear to have any, uh, there's nothing too complicated in their programming because of the nature of them. But given that, that also makes them kind of hard to evaluate, which is the point of the master theorem today. The master theorem is going to be uh, a general method for us to evaluate uh, the time complexity of uh, divide and conquer algorithms, right? So all of you may be familiar with merge sort. First, first, what is uh, a sorting algorithm? A sorting algorithm you may already know. You may, you should have some background about all these sorting algorithms uh, already. Mer uh, merge sort is just one sorting algorithm today, and we're going to focus on it just because it is uh, re re recursive in this way and optimal. But a sorting algorithm, you have a set of elements. I don't know three two, one, four, and it outputs the elements in an increasing order. So one, two, three, four. So you, you assume, as your atomic steps, that the elements all have some bounded size, and that comparing two elements takes constant time. You measure your algorithm runtime in the number of elements. Is that? the best model to do it in, it's the easiest one. So like in the real world, if you have an array of, of a billion or something, the elements may not be unique. They may have, um, comparing them may not take constant time. You know, If you have arbitrarily long strings and you're trying to alphabetize something, it does, certainly doesn't take constant time to compare two arbitrarily large elements. But then you'll have a time complexity that's in terms of two numbers. It'll be in terms of the number of elements in the array, and then perhaps the max size of the elements in the array. right? And then maybe you're actually trying to measure something on an average size of the element of the array. So we can, just as a, as a great generality and without having to uh, make things too complicated, we can suppose that comparing two elements does take constant time. right? Kind of, kind of simple. For, for, for bounded numbers, for example, 32 bit numbers, that, that should be easy. Um, given that, uh, we can define merge sort. Uh, as follows. So suppose we're given as input an array, which is indexed from 1 to n. Now, you may be more familiar with 0 n indexing, and that is the way I think everyone should be thinking. But unfortunately, all the textbooks are written by mathematicians and not computer scientists. So all the array indexing in all the best textbooks begins with 1. So the f a of 1 is the first element of the array. That's just a convention you'll have to get used to in this class. Oh. I can't see anything. Right. So every divide and conquer algorithm has to have some base case. There has to be, you keep dividing until you detect that you're at the smallest possible case you could be in, and then you just return simply that. So what we're going to do is if uh, n is equal to 1, we're simply going to return a. Pretty simple of a base case. If the array has one element, trivially it's already sorted. All the elements are in an increasing order, um, simply because it has one element. It's vacuously, this property holds. Every, of course, every array of one element is already sorted. So we return that. Now, it may not seem, why do we do that yet? But when we uh, 
implement the recursive part of merge sort, uh, it'll make sense. So what we do is we say uh, the left half is going to take on merge sort of uh, A, but the first half of the elements. We'll say the floor of n over 2. Right. This notation means you split the array in half, and L takes on the merge sort of the first half of the elements of the array. Now, notice here immediately the, the, the merge sort function is calling merge sort. So this is already a recursive algorithm. Then we do it for the uh, right half. So we split the array in half evenly and call, re call merge sort on both halves. Now, you may already be asking, well, what if the array has odd length? What if all these other things happen? And the, the answer is, is that the divide and conquer algorithms all assume that the length of the input is something nice, simply because uh, it makes writing the code easier when we put it on the board. If you were to actually implement this, you would have to handle uh, small cases like that. And it wouldn't divide evenly. But that's fine, because then you just have to be the arbitrary breaker of it. Say it had seven elements. Left may have three, right may have four. Fine. But then when you recurse on the elements, the first three elements, then you maybe split it again into two and one, something like this. The decision has to be made. It can be made arbitrarily, but the decision to split must be made. Right? Um, now we have two halves. Uh, both of them are sorted. We need to recombine them in a sorted uh, manner. So we uh, return merge of L and R. All right, so merge is a function. We'll define it in just a second. But what it do, does is it takes as input two sorted arrays, and it outputs a uh, sorted array. It has, it, it has assumed as input. The inputs are two arrays. They're sorted. And it outputs a sorted array. Now, here's one of the cool parts about uh, merge sort, at least, is it doesn't appear to be any algorithm here. It's almost ridiculous. It's like if you ask someone to sort something, and they'll say, OK, first they split in half, and then I sort it, and then I put them back together. That doesn't sound like they solved any problem. I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't think I learned anything about sorting just from the description of the problem because of the way the function calls itself. Yet, it works correctly. It, th that's at least personally, my motivating fa factor for divide and conquer is that the algorithms are so ridiculously simple looking that there's no way that seems that that would work. But that's the elegance. They do work. They all work. A second thing is that this merge function is actually handling quite a lot. It's actually doing way more than it seems like it's doing. Splitting the array in half and recursively calling it fine. Uh, but the merge function does some, has to do uh, the, more work than it appears it, it's doing. right? Uh, any questions on merge sort before we do merge? Any questions on this part? Yeah, certainly not. When you divide and conquer, you may suppose that the pieces are disjoint. Other divide and conquer algorithms may share something, but in a more optimal way, it would appear that the information should be distinct. Right. Uh, so uh, let's define, um, well, first, I guess let's do an execution of, the, of this problem. So let's do it on this array. We'll do 5, 4, uh, 7, and 2, uh, 1. Two, uh, excuse me, one, three, and two, and six, right? Now, merge, uh, merge sort, and it's by the way, conveniently, I've chosen eight elements because when you split the array in half, it's it, eight is a power of two, so you divide it all the way. It's gonna there's not gonna be any breaking going on. Now, if we split this in half as merge sort requires us to, we're gonna get two elements, two arrays, excuse me, of five and four, uh, seven and two. And then 1, 3, and 2, and 6, right? So far, no, no sorting has occurred in this. Then we're going to split 5 and 4 
five four seven two into five and four. And we're going to, uh, and 7 and 2. Then this is going to be 1 and 3, and 2 and 6. Maybe I should have put it uh, the other way. Let me just rewrite it. Okay. This is going to split again into five, array of only size one of five, of four, of seven, two, one, three, two, six, right? We've hit the base case of size one. We do not divide any further because we can't divide any further, but because the code has been written uh, in such a way that if the array has exactly one element, then you return it. Uh, we also can't divide any further, but it, we do it because that's what the code says. Um, now here's where the, the sorting occurs. When we, get, we take two elements, they return. This is an L and this is an R. The return of them is merged, but it's merged in a way that's sorted. So when we recombine these two parts, the, re the, the return call of these two is not going to be 5, 4. It's going to be 4, 5. We all see that? Assuming that merge works, this is what's returned from those two stacks. The base case of 5 is returned up. The base case of 4 is returned up. That's going to be L and R. And then those are passed to the merge function, which does correctly sort them. Right? Similar here, we're going to, uh, 7 and 2 are going to be swapped. So it's going to be 2, 7 as one array. 1 and 3 is going to be the same, 1, 3. And 2, 6 is going to be the same. Right? Now we need to call merge on these two. So what's going to happen, this, the merge of these two is going to be uh, 2, uh, 4, 5, 7. And the merge of these two is going to be um, 1, 2, 3, 6. Right? We agree? Yeah? Let's try. I'm going to try all the buttons. Try that one. Nope. Is that one good? Is that too dim? Maybe? I think it's good. OK. Um, right. And these two are going to return. This is going to be an L. This is going to be an R. And as we um, return these, we're going to recombine them. But the merge function is going to sort them for us. That sounds right. 1, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Now, uh, two things we can do. We kind of see that it works. Uh, we've only assumed that merge works, and we haven't gone into detail about why it works. We'll do that in just a second. Uh, but if you wanted to prove correctness of, an al uh, of a recursive algorithm, what technique would you use? I think I asked this Monday, but let's see if you guys remember the answer. <laughs> induction. Here's how, it, here's how the proof of induction works. It's ridiculously simple if for every recursive algorithm. Assume that you prove the base case to work. So the first line of code is correct. By strong induction, you get to assume all the recursive calls on smaller subproblems are correct. So you assume that L and R are computed correctly by induction. You don't have to prove those are computed correctly. You just assume them by strong induction. That's why induction is such a powerful technique for recursive algorithms. In fact, historically, the words induction and recursion used to mean the same thing. Now they mean different things, but that's, that's, that's the history there. Now you just need to, if L and R are correct, the algorithm is correct if merge is correct. So we can easily see that merge sort is correct, depending upon if merge is correct. So now all we need to do is go into detail if merge is correct to see that merge sort will sort the array. Once we finish talking about the correctness of it, then we can just talk about the um, runtime, which for, an, for a recursive algorithm like this is not, uh, is not trivial.
So merge takes on two arrays. We'll call that x1 to, and what letters did I use? x1 to xk, y1 to m, just to have two different letters. And it itself, merge will also be a recursive algorithm. So what we're going to do is our two base cases, we want to merge two sorted arrays. We can easily merge them if the arrays are empty. So that's going to be our base case. So if uh, x is, is empty, return y. If y is empty, return x, right? Certainly those are the base cases. Now, here's one of the most powerful parts about this. Merge sort is going to have its efficiency come from the fact that it assumes its input is sorted, right? If you think about it, binary search really fast. But the reason it's so fast is the fact that you get the promise that the input is sorted. If you don't have the promise that the input is sorted, you can check it, but then that takes linear time. The fact that it takes logarithmic time, binary search, is the fact that you get to assume the input is sorted. Here, we're going to get a similar uh, uh, power in the efficiency. By assuming that x1 and y1 are sorted, we know immediately how to sort, uh, we, excuse me, how to merge these correctly, right? Suppose we want, we already knew the answer to this, okay? That's an array, that's an array. We want to somehow interlace the elements together such that the answer we output is going to be sorted. The first element of the answer is going to be the smallest of x1 or y1. That's something you need to convince yourself of. Imagine you had two piles that are sorted. The smallest of the merger of the piles has to be either the first element of one stack or the other. So that's the way we're going to do it. Can everyone see that? So if x1 is smaller than y1, then we know that we're just going to return x1, but then we're going to append to it a recursive call of merge, which merges x2 to k, which is as if we removed the first element. So x2 to xk is x without the first element. We're going to return the merger of x, the rest of x with y. Now, the rest of x is still stored, sorted if we remove the first element. And y, of course, by assumption, is still sorted. So these are two still sorted arrays that are going to merge. Merge will merge those recursively and then append that to x, 1. And of course, we can just do the else quickly. Return uh, y1 dot join merge of x1 k uh, y uh, to m. Let's kind of loosely argue about why this is correct, okay? Suppose we're in this case that x1 is less than or equal to y1. Now, what if the first element is the first element of y? Then it doesn't really matter in a sorted array. Uh, if, you, if your array has indistinct elements, if two elements of your array are the same, then there is multiple ways to sort your array, quote unquote, because it doesn't matter if those two elements swap place because they'll be next to each other, right? There's a two and a two here. If you swap them around, it doesn't do anything. So you just need to make a decision arbitrarily for cases like that. You can't just say greater than equals to, and then another case, uh, strictly greater than and strictly less than without handling an equals case. It just has, it has to be made. Yeah? Uh, the join function is, maybe I use some Pythonic features, but that's like you have two arrays, it just outputs an array that combines them. So given two arrays, it, it just appends them together. It's an appending operation. Oh, okay. More questions? On, questions on the, on the code before we argue about the proof? Yes? Yeah? 
Yes. So uh, let's just look at, um, I don't know, let's say we have one, two, and we're trying to append, um, I don't know, two, five, okay? We're trying, those are both sorted, and let's say we're trying to merge them, okay? We're going to look at the first two of these elements. One is smaller. So what we're going to do is to merge these, we're going to do one plus the merge of uh, two, three, and uh, two, five. Does that make sense? The join is, a com is, is an array operation that takes two arrays and simply appends them together. Yes, exactly. We've decided, this is deciding for us the first element of the sorting, of the answer. That's what that does. Uh, because it returns this, even though this is going to be computed through a recursive call. Let's sort of loosely argue about the correctness of merge. If you have two sorted arrays, I claim the smallest of the first elements of both arrays will be the smallest of the merge of them, right? Here's the answer. If x1 is less than or equal to y1, suppose we're in this case, y1, by assumption of sorting ascendedly, is also less than all the other elements of y. So we know that x is less than all the elements of y. Do we agree? x1, by a definition, is the first element of x. So by the sorted assumption, it's also less than all the other elements of x. So if x1 is less than or equal to y1, it's less than all the elements of x, and it's less than all the elements of y. So it's less than the merge. The answer, x1 is the first one. The answer is symmetric in the other case, because y1 would be, then be smaller than all of x and all of y, so we would put y1 first. The smallest of these two is the smallest of the answer, is the first of, of both of them. And that has to do with the assumption of, uh, that really shows how powerful it is, the assumption that the answer we're given in already is sorted for us. We don't have to do any sorting, we just have to shuffle them in in the correct order. Any questions on that? Yeah? You can sort strings. Any data type that has a comparison operation, you can do it. Implement that somehow other way. Yeah? I mean, by symmetry, I don't think so. I think if you took the, if you made that, I think it would just be as fine. Because this case would handle the equals. If they're equal, it doesn't really matter. And to, to, to that extent, just swap the x and y. Just call merge on l and r and r and l, right? Yeah, if they're both sorted, they're sorted still. So, yeah. Sometimes I'm, I, I'm sure that you have to be the, uh, judge, and you have to decide which way to flip the coin because for the algorithm to work out nicely. When we implement divide and conquer algorithms of the board, we just assume everything's a nice power of two, right? Okay, here's now the first question on, on time complexity. What is the uh, assumed runtime of this algorithm? Not n log n, just, excuse me, just merge, just merge. You probably all have memorized the fact that sorting takes n log n optimally. But just merge. How long does merge take? Let's think about it. Let's suppose that there are n elements passed into merge. So let's suppose k plus m is n. Okay. Uh, we're going to, you can measure an algorithm by the depth of the recursion calls and the work done at each level. So here we're picking one element and then we're calling merge. So each recursive call fixes one element. It's going to fix x1, fine, recursively. It's going to then fix x, uh, the, the second one, then the third one, then the fourth one. So at each decision, one element is made. One, decision, one element of the answer is chosen. So there are how many recursive calls? The number of recursive calls is the number of elements. It's going to be n. The work done at each level is constant. You're simply doing some comparisons and, and, and recursive calls. Right? One recursive call is made. So it's going to be O of n. Do we see that? That's kind of important. You guys should be able to see that's O of n work done. Yes? Each recursive call makes exactly one recursive call. 
So the, and one recursive call is made per symbol in X or Y, so the depth is also N. Here, that won't be the case because we're calling it twice. So think of it like a binary tree versus thinking of it like a tree that's, I mean, a line. So it just goes straight down and then straight back up. This also, by the way, does not need to be implemented recursively. It's just cooler if you do it recursively, but it doesn't need to be done. You could do this, of course, non-recursively, just by choosing the next elements. And instead of making a recursive call, you just in a loop or something, right? Yes? Great. Then the answer is joined together. But detecting that also takes linear time. Mm -hmm. You would choose x1, then you would choose x2, and then you would choose x3, and then after you've exhausted all of x, then you would choose y1. Well, then you would do this base case. If x is empty, then you would just return y. So you would turn y append x. I mean, x append y, excuse me. Yeah. Great questions. All right. Um, so this we know merge takes O of n. Let's try to analyze the runtime of merge sort. Yeah? Uh, yes, yes. You usually, in a recursive algorithm, as we'll see today, you're really bounded by the number of recursive calls and the work done at each level, and the amount of work that you give to your recursive calls, right? We'll, we'll answer this question in great, the, that's the point of the master theorem, is to easily tell us the complexity of recursive algorithms, right? Does what? Uh, we may assume that, and that is a question about uh, algorithms more, excuse me, about computers more than it is about algorithms. Um, and you could probably suppose there is an architecture that allows this, that does not require you to perform a copy for each uh, recursive call that you make, and that in memory it, the answer may simply lie there and pointers are moved around. You can believe that that does not require any additional time complexity in a, in a convenient way. In an inconvenient way, maybe, but let's be convenient, right? Um, all right, let's analyze the runtime of merge sort. So let's just call it T of n first. A recursive algorithm is going to have what's called a recurrence. And a recurrence is the time T of n in terms of T of n. So T of n is the time it takes, merge sort takes, on inputs of size n, right? Now, what does merge sort do? It does a constant amount of checking. It makes two recursive calls, but the recursive calls are made on inputs of half the size. Do we agree with that part so far? Then we're returning merge. And if we assume that L plus R is n elements, then we know merge takes O of n time. This is called a recurrence. Now, what that, how to solve that recurrence, if you take in combo, you, you may know that there's like these sequences that ha are defined recursively in this way, actually kind of like Fibonacci. And finding closed forms of them is not easy. Right? We, in the most combinatorial sense, it's not. Like we have the Fibonacci recurrence, and we were also able to give an exponential closed form for the Fibonacci to say, oh, they grow this fast or something. But it's not obvious how to achieve that, right? So given this, you should know that actually t of n is n log n. How is that true? We don't know yet. So what we're going to do, instead of analyzing this specific recurrence, we're going to analyze a general class of recurrences, a large class of recurrences, and solve um, every divide and conquer algorithm at the same time. Questions on that specific recurrence before we get to the general form in the master theorem? So a master theorem will always have, any, any recursive algorithm can be written 
in a recurrence that looks something like this. T of n is equal to a t of n over b plus o of n to the d. Now, given a recursive algorithm, you need to be able to turn it into a recurrence. Then given a recurrence, you'll apply the master theorem and be able to turn it into an easy to understand time complexity, a big O of something. But what do these, number, these letters mean? A is the branching factor. A is the number of recursive calls. So given code, you want to first convert it into a recurrence. How would you do that? So A is going to be the number of times, uh, the number of recursive calls. And intuitively, you can see that as just the number of times the function calls itself. It may be non-trivial, um, but here we see that A is 2 because merge sort calls merge sort twice, right? Here, B is the size of the subproblem because n over b is going to be smaller than n by a uh, multiplicative factor of b, right? If you recall the recurrence for Fibonacci, it was not dividing the, sub the size of the subproblem, but subtracting the size of the subproblem. So the subproblem in the Fibonacci example grew much sm smaller. Subtracting something decreases n much, small, much slower than dividing by b, right? So the Fibonacci one grew quite slowly, and in, the, in that sense, the time grew quite fast. Here, b, we're assuming that the, the, the time decreases multiplicatively each time by b. So b is the size, n over b is the size of the subproblems. So you go look at the function, the recursive calls, just intuitively, and then you see the size of, the, of, of what's being given to the recursive calls, and you say, well, okay, a1, a n over 2 is half of n. So it's going to be n over 2. That's the way to determine this. So we know that this is going to be n over 2 here, so b is 2. Then you look at all the other work. This d term is the time it takes for the, re, for the division and the recombination cost. So it usually will be dominated by the recombination cost, usually. So in that case, that's the time complexity of merge. But it's also the time of all the other parts, splitting the array. If we have to do any pre-processing calculation, that goes into this n to the d term here. And in this case, d is just 1. Right? So given a, a program, that's exactly how you'll turn it into uh, a recurrence. Now, we have a general recurrence. How do we solve the recurrence? So suppose we have an algorithm that has, uh, instead of 2, 2, and 1, we just have uh, a, b, and, and d. Let's, yeah. yeah. D is what? B or D? D is the work done. So D in, in, in the merge sort example is the time for merge and all the other parts, which take a trivial amount of time. Merge is the, this last term D is the work done at each level. Not the work delegated to the subproblems, but the work that I'm doing. That's the work done at each level, yeah. All right, so let's suppose we wanted to give a general recurse, uh, uh, this recursion generally. Do you guys remember anything about a geometric series? Vaguely, maybe? So if we draw the recursion stack, what does it look like? We have our, we have our sub problem at the top here. Uh, we have our, our original problem at the top here. And we divide it into some sub problems. If, our, if we're dividing it into A sub problems, then our branching factor at this point is A, right? Maybe I'll use a different color. Do we agree? If we have A recursive calls, the top stack is going to have A branches out of it, if we're drawing the recursion tree. In the case of two, it's a binary tree. But in general, there may be more than two recursive calls made. A is, A, that's what A is. Similarly, these are all going to be A as well. We agree? But there are A of them per A previously. For each recursive call makes A its recursive calls itself. So there are actually A squared recursive calls here. Right?
The work done at the top level is going to be uh, O of n to the d. The work done at the second level is going to be A recursive calls, but they're going to be uh, of size n over b. So each of those levels is going to do its own merge call, but the merge call will not be on inputs of size n, but size n over b. So this is going to do A times O of n over b to the d. Do we agree? Yeah. B is the size of the subproblem that we're, get, we're given. So for example, in merge, the top level you have n elements. But put yourself in the frame of mind of, a, of one recursive call down. You now have n over two elements to work with. So now you're, everything is going to be shifted. You're not going to be thinking in terms of n, but n over 2. So the work done at this level, the merge is not going to take n to the d time, n time. It's going to take n over 2 time. Here, in general, we write that as n over b to the d. That's the work done at each level. But now there are a recursive calls for that. So it's going to be a for the number of recursive calls. Each one is going to be doing this much work at each level. Right? Do we see this? Yeah? So, like, often, actually, the best algorithms will nicely divide the work up equally into its children. Not always, though. Sometimes the problems are that you need several recursive calls on inputs of only a half. We will see algorithms where there's four recursive calls necessary and on inputs of size n over 2. And then you can speed this up to uh, three recursive calls necessary for inputs of size n over 2. But keep the case that a equals b in mind when we do the recursion. It seems like the nice way would to split the labor up equally among its children, but it's not necessarily the case because there, there may be overlap necessary. Yeah. So the n over b is the is the size of the input at that level. Okay. So the time of merge at that level is going to be n over b to the d, which is just n over b, n over two, right? Uh, similarly, the the level after that, those are going to make its own recursive calls. There's going to be a squared of them, but the subproblem will get divided again. Do we see the pattern? Yeah? We'll see that next time. It's, they're not easy examples. Multiplication. What is a recursive multiplication algorithm? We'll have to see. So sorting is nice, because sorting is an easily defined recursive problem, because it can be composed of, recurs of its recursive parts and divide out nicely. Not all problems are like this. Matrix multiplication is another recursive one that requires s several subproblems, overlapping subproblems. Um, you'll just have to see. OK, we see the pattern, right? The i-th level will be a to the i, o of n over b to the i to the d, right? And you keep subdividing, and you keep subdividing, and you keep subdividing until what happens? Until you run out of divisions, and you are at a base case. So eventually, you'll have leaves of the tree. And each of those leaves will be of size 1. Right? But how many leaves are there? The number of leaves is a function of the depth of the tree. Right? So consider a binary tree. If a binary tree has depth k, how many leaves are there? Uh, other way around. If a binary tree has depth k, yeah, there's two to the k leaves. Right? So to what depth do we stop? We stop dividing 
the depth of tree is when we stop dividing. So uh, is, it's going to be i. Uh, n over b to the i runs out. Do we agree? If n to the b to the i runs out, we can no longer divide n by b to the i, then we'll do it. i is the levels of the tree. So, so some i will be the depth of the tree, right? But when does n to the i, uh, uh, so what i uh, does that run out? Does uh, n is equal to b to the i? What i is that? It's almost too simple of an answer. log base b of n, right? When i is equal to log base b of n, we're at the bottom level of recursion of the tree, right? Each, each base case, we may assume, takes constant work, T constant time to evaluate the smallest base cases, by definition. If it takes non-constant time for a base case, then you haven't, divi you haven't divided far enough, right? Um, so we know the depth of the tree is going to be this. So the number of leaves is going, like, if you have depth k of 2k leaves, if the number of leaves is going to be a to the log base b of n. Do we see that? That's like the 2. That's the branching factor. That's the depth. So this is the number of leaves. We also know that each leaf takes O1 time, so you would multiply that by the time it takes for the leaves, but the leaves is 1, so it's, that. it's just the number of leaves we're counting, right? Now, there's a log rule you can apply here to make this nicer. This is actually equal to n to the log base b of a. As you get more comfortable with big O, you'll remember these quickly. You can swap those two around, a and n, swap that way. So it's actually polynomial in something. So we know, we know the number of leaves are exactly that, right? Oh. oh. I'll leave this up here. Let's just add everything up, all the work done. Uh, it's going to be the leaves plus the recursion. That's the runtime. So it's going to be the sum of i is equal to 0 to the depth of the tree, which is going to be log base b of n. And it's going to be a to the i times o of n over b to the i to the d. That's the recursion, the work done for the recursion, right? Plus the time it takes for the base cases, the leaves, which is going to be O of n to the log base b of a, right? Great. So we've actually written, if you've noticed here, we've written the time complexity, time complexity of the recursive problem here, here, but we've written it without any recursion in it. There's no t of n on the right-hand side. Great. Now, we could stop here and just say, OK, that's the time complexity. But when you take the big O of something, you always just want the dominating term. So now we have several cases about what the dominating terms, the terms are. Um, and I'll write it again up here. So again, it's t of n is equal to the sum of i is equal to 0 to log base b of n of a to the i, o of n over b to the i uh, to the d plus o of n to the log base b of a. Right. So we actually have three cases for t of n.
Something like that. It's going to be O of n to the d if d is greater than log base b of a. And it's going to be O of n to the log base b of a if uh, d is less than log base b of a. And it's going to be something we'll talk about in a second if uh, d is equal to log base b of a. So this is the master theorem. It has three cases like this. Uh, let's evaluate the three cases. Suppose that the problem shrinks so quickly, it subdivides out so fast, that the dominating term of this summation is simply the first term for i equals 0. You have a sum of log many terms plus an O of log to the N, a B of A. If the work done at the top level is more than the work done at the leaves and the division, then we know D must be greater than log base B of A. So the work done is N to the D. The first term of this is just N to the D for i equals 0. Agree? Another way to think of that is think of a tree that has a really thick trunk, but then the branches get thin way too fast. So the work done, the dominate, when you take the big O, the dominating, work the dominating work done is simply the trunk. It's the root. So in this case, it's n to the d. Another way to think of that is like, what is the biggest term here? If d is greater than log base b of a, it better be the first term of the summation, which is n to the d. That's the first case. The second case is where the problem divides so fast, but the trunk is quite skinny. So you have so many leaves, the number of leaves grows way faster than the work done at each level. In that case, the dominating term is not even the division, but it's the work done at each level, which is going to be this one. So in the case that the work done at each level is greater than the way the, the, the division occurs, then we know that it's actually log base b of a. Right? Yeah. Ah, so let's, let's think about that for a second. If d is equal to log b is b of a, then actually there is a balance between the division of labor and the, and the branching factor. The work done at each level kind of corresponds equally. We can think of this as a very well-balanced tree where the branches of each level, the number of branches times their weight is kind of equal. So this is a very nice and pleasant looking tree. Each, if each level is equal, let's just work it out. If each level is equal, then we know that from i equals 0, log base b of n of a to the i, o of n to the b to the i to the d, plus o of n to the log base b of a. We want to see what happens when d equals log base b of a. If that's the case, then n to the log base b of a is just going to be n to the d, right? And in the case that d equals log base b of a, we actually know that each level is the same. So they're all equivalent to the first level. So this is actually just the sum of log base b of n uh, equals 0 to log base b of n of just o of n to the d, plus an o of n to the d term. So this is going to be what? This is going to be o of n to the d. But we add log many of them. The number of terms here is a function of n. Do we see that? If all the branches are equal, you can't just take the largest one. You have to add the summation of them. So given that, it's just log. You just put a log there. So if, n, if d equals log base b of a, it's the same as the previous case, but then you just put a log there. Yes? Sure. If, these, if d equals log base b of a, we know the branches, each division is equal. If you were to cut this tree down and weigh these two sections, they would come out the same. The division happens exactly at the same rate of the uh, size of the subproblem. 
So like, imagine it's it's actually well, it's some foreshadowing. That's why it's has a lot. If you have four things in one bucket, it's the same thing as having uh, two buckets of two things each. The weight doesn't change in that sense. So in the sense that the division actually is the same, so d is equal to log base b of a, then you have to count all the levels combined. There is no one single term you can pull out and say, this has to be the greatest term. I'm done. You have to count the sum of the terms. So each term then weighs what? O of n to the d. Right? It just weighs as much as the first. And we could do a to the i, n to the e over i, but that's confusing. When I could just do n to the d, because it weighs n to the d. That's what we're done at each level, n to the d, up to a constant factor, right? So then you just take the summation of a log, it's going to be, you just multiply by that log factor. Yeah? Ah, great question. And the answer is, what's the difference asymptotically in log bases? Uh, when you want to perform a change of base for a logarithm, you simply multiply by a number. Do you remember the logarithm change of base formula? Off the top of my head, oh, God. Uh, log base b of a n is equal to log base a of n over log base b of a? Something like that. I don't remember. Don't look at that too hard. It's something like that, OK? And the log base b of a is a constant. So all logs are actually asymptotically the same as each other. Something like that. I don't remember the log formula. It, lo it looks like that. Um, so when the log is quote unquote on the ground, we don't have to write the number. Log base 2 is asymptotically the same as log base 3, right? All those logs are the same. If the log is in the exponent, that's not true. It does determine if the log is anywhere else. But if the log is just sitting there by itself, then it's fine. That's why we don't write the log. It's not that it's even assumed or implied that it's a base 2 log, because it's not here. It's a base b. Right. Any questions on the derivation of the master theorem before we apply it? That's a log right there. So you add log many things. It's multiplying by log. There's no i in this, thankfully. So we just, this is, this is just O of n to the d plus O of n to the d plus, and there's log of those. Yeah. So pull out the log, then you have, pull out the n to the d of log times it, right? More questions on the derivation of the master theorem before we get into applying it? Yes? D is the power done at each level. D is the work done at each level. In our merge sort example, D is the recombination cost. So every divide and conquer has, a, has uh, the division work done. That counts as D. The recursive calls, the work done in the recursive calls is handled by a different call stack. It's handled by somehow you in the future. And that's accounted for in a different part of the problem. It's accounted for recursively. But the work you're doing at that level, d, n to the d, corresponds to the work that you do to divide and recombine, not recursively the work done at all. It handles like the base cases and the, uh, the merge call or any other work that you may have to do. Yeah. All right, given that this is the master theorem, uh, we have these three cases, and you should be easy, it should be easy for you to memorize it. It's not too hard, because you know you can just compare d and log base b of a. And if one of those are greater, then you just choose the greater of the two, right? D is greater, it's D. If, B, if log base B of A is greater, you choose log base B of A. If they're equal, you just do N to the D and you slap on the log. It's simple to remember. It's very simple to memorize. Yes? For which letter? Ah, well. If it's not polynomial, we are way out of bounds. Suppose it's something super polynomial. It's not within the realm of, of a feasible computation, so we can ignore it. Someone else's job. Um, if it's something like, let's suppose the work done at each level was not a nice polynomial. If it was n log n, OK, what would you do? You actually just, this is a simplified version of the master theorem. You can rederive the master theorem with powers of log in there, poly logs in d. And it gets more complicated. But the easy way to do that is just bound n log n by n squared, and then apply the master theorem. You'll overestimate it, but that's fine.
All right, let's apply the master theorem. We wrote out, I've erased it, but we remember the recurrent. It's t of n is equal to 2 t of n over 2 plus O of n, right? There was two recursive calls made. You split the array in half. You split the arrays in half, and you recursively call merge sort on each half. Then the work done at each level was simply the, dominated by the time it takes to call merge. And the time it takes to call merge is O of n time. So this was the recurrence for um, merge sort, right? Any, we remember this? We should be able to easily get this. Now, we can, all we need to do is um, apply the master theorem. All we need to do is check the cases. So A is going to be 2, B is going to be 2, and then D is going to be 1. And then so log base B of A is going to be log base 2 of 2, which is 1. So D is equal to 1, and log base B of A is equal to 1. So we apply case 2. So we know that T of n is O of n to the D log n. But we know that D one, so that's n log n. Right. Here's the observation again about log base B of A. Log base B of A is B A is the branching factor, B is the division of work. So log base B of A, if B equals A, if you divide exactly the same as the parts you give your subproblems, then log base B of A is going to be log base the same number. And log base B of B is always going to be 1. So this is how fast the problem grows or shrinks. It's going to be 1. Right. So if that dominates the work done at each level or not is how, why you compare D to log base B of A. Yeah? Why is D 1? D is 1 because N is O of N is O of N to the 1. Great question. Yeah? Log 2 of 2 is 1. Um, why is that true? That's cool, I think. Hmm? Yeah. But you, you can always assume that log base uh, 2 of 2 is 1. Maybe we could prove it quickly. Let's see. Let's suppose log base 2 of, let's compute log base 2 of 2 is equal to x, and then we exponentiate both sides, so we get uh, 2 to the log base 2 of 2 is equal to 2 to the x, which is, and those are going to cancel out. So you're going to get 2 to the, 2 is equal to 2 to the x, so x is 1. Which one? D? This one here? Yeah. This one is which, when you compute the case that you want to plug it into. Oh. So we just compute log base B of A simply and only to compare it with D. Oh. Yeah. When you compare it with D, then you're done. Yeah. Those get more complicated, and you will have to, to apply the master theorem, get creative. You can upper bound, lower bound as you need to, right? I mean, it does happen. There was a, a problem I've seen where it's like, instead of dividing by it, it square roots it. It's not too hard, though. You, what you do is you simply re-derive the master theorem in this case. You just think about the, the big tree that we erased and, and, and try and re-get re the recurrence out, right, for that special case. All right, one more uh, application of the master theorem. And you will be applying the master theorem to other recurrences on your homework and stuff. But one more quick sanity check um, is binary search. Binary search is, uh, binary search is, that doesn't have to be implemented recursively, but it is, a, it can be implemented recursively. You have uh, an array, you have some target, you check the midpoint, and then, whether or not the midpoint is greater than or less than, you recurse on the first half or the second half, right? So we can actually write binary search this way recursively and get the, the, get the factors out. So again, for t of n is equal to a t of n over b plus o of n to the d. In this example of binary search, what is a? How many branches does binary search make? One. That's actually the speed of binary search. You don't have to recursively call on each half. You only pick one half and recursively call on that. So it's actually one. 
What's the size of the subproblem for binary search if you recursively call in each half? It's going to be two. You split the problem in half each time on one recursive call, and you call binary search again on the smaller array, right, of half, size half, on the left half or the right half, but not both. Merge sort has to call on both. Binary search calls on one half or the right half. Now, what's the work done at each level? Kind of an interesting question. It's a constant amount of work done. Why? All you're doing is checking the middle element. Right? If it's constant, then d is equal to zero. So let's do, let's plug these in. We have log base two of one. What is log base two of one? Zero, yeah. Well, d is equal to zero, so we see that d is equal to log base b of a. So we put in the second case, it's going to be o of n to the d log n, which is just n to the zero, which is just log n. You have very likely proven that um, binary search does log n in a different way. But if you think about it, the proof of the master theorem is simply a generalization of the proof of binary search being log n, but with all the other numbers in there, right? If you restrict the proof of the master theorem, it will be log n, because your branching factor will be 1, the problem divides by 2 each time, and the work done each level is constant. That's it's the same thing, right? So using the master theorem, though, we can quickly see it's also log n. Yes? A was 1 because the problem, and you, in, in binary search, you have an array, right? You check the midpoint, and depending upon greater than and less than, you either recurse only on the right half or the left half. So you don't, you just toss out half. You don't recursively call it on half. Merge sort, you recursively call it on both halves. But you just focus again, if, depending on what the midpoint answer was, you just ch repeat the problem on half of the array. You don't recursively call it on both. So instead of your tree looking like this, very different than looking like this. That's a branching factor of two. Very different than a branching factor of one, looks like, which looks like this. Right? That's very different than that, complexity-wise. Yeah? D? Well, the work that each level is constant, right? Is there another question here? Sure. Yeah. Uh, talking about like or applying that to the like is the like A uh has to be the uh and by a D that's like the divide function. Exactly. I would think of the conquer actually as the leaves being done, but think of D locally as the work being done at the level that you're at. The top level, in fact. So the recurrence A to the B. Uh, a, uh, this recurrence, A over T n to the B plus O of n to the D, D, B, uh, D, n to the D, think of this as the top level only. This is handling the recursive part for you. That's computed some other way. But this is the work done at the top level for the recombination. This is the number of recursive calls you make, and that's the work done for those recursive calls. Yeah. More questions? Yeah? In this one, b is 2 because what's the size of the subproblem in binary search? You half the array each time. It's not, and we haven't seen an example yet that has like a third or a fourth or something, right? But if you did, then that's what that would look like. Quick application of this again. Um, we did merge sort by splitting the arrays in half and are calling merge sort recursively on that. But we could easily split the array into quarters, or thirds, or any other thing, and recursively call on that. But in that case, we don't get any speed up, because b still equals a. So we are still in the same case. Log base 3 of 3 is the same as log base 2 of 2, same as log base 5 of 5, and so on. Right? Doesn't matter. So splitting, merge sort, splitting up to 3, doesn't have any asymptotic gain. More questions? Yeah? Yeah. Um, if A is just log, mm -hmm. how exactly do you know that the tree is balanced? Ah, so in, if D is equal to log of B of A, we know that the tree is balanced. So we know that each level weighs the same. So it might as well look at the only term that doesn't have I in it. If they're all equal, look at the term without I, which is simply going to be the first term. 
which is n to the d. Yeah? Ah, if d is 1, it's linear time. It's not linear time, though. It's not 1. It's 0. It has to be 0. Yeah. All right. If there's any more questions, I'll be available after class.